My name is Elwyn Morgan. I'm the Chairman of Governors for the school, Lewis School, Pengam. I first of all became the Chairman in 1985 and as a result of that I've been involved in the school perhaps on a day-to-day -day basis ever since. When I was in school, it was an elementary school in a little village called Derry, and in the school I had no interest at all in education. And then one day one of the teachers said to me, he said, listen Ellen, if you don't start doing something, then what's going to happen to you is that you'll be working in the pit for the rest of your life. And what I actually did then was work hard and then I could show off a bit because I became top. What happened then was when I went to the pit and I was interviewed, I was fortunate enough not to have to do a job pushing trams or picking slag off a coal belt that was going past. They offered me a job as messenger boy. This was a big step forward because um, I didn't get dirty every day for a start. The next thing I realized was that I was working one morning next to a, a collier and I was still being taught what to do and there was a big lump that came through the face and I found out then that it was the agent. Now the agent was the man that you said yes sir, no sir, everything else to. As a result of this, um, he turned to his deputy that was behind him and he couldn't work out certain areas and he couldn't work out a lot of other things. So one of the colliers that was working there said, ask that little bee, he knows because he'd go to night school. So he turned to me and he said, well, can you work this out? I said, yes, I'll work it out for you, Mr. Williams. So I worked the figures out for him and the next thing I knew was when I came up the pit that day, I had been called into the manager's office. Went into the manager's office and he said, Elwyn, um, we want you to come up the pit and work in one of the offices. There were 17 girls in the office. So there were three of us boys. Now the girls now suggested that I should be the leader of the trade union movement. I got appointed then as the delegate and uh, doing that I, I then got offered a full-time job. I used to then look after not only the coal board but you had to look after BOEC, you had to look after the steel industry, you had to look after a lot of other bodies that was represented by what was then called the Clerical and Administrative Workers Union. But it proved one thing to me and it came over very early in my life that if you do put your back into it and if you do get some sort of uh, literacy and numeracy together then what you can do is that you can gain no end of advantages when you go out into the wide world. Merlin Rees, who was the Secretary of State for Ireland, uh, Merlin wanted to come down and he wanted to go down a pit where he had actually been brought up, a place called um, Abacanon. And I remember when he came down, of course, he had to bring this entourage of detectives and put in mirrors then under the car to make sure everything was all right. So. Uh, we went down Abercannon Pit and I'll never forget it because on the top of the pit they got what's called a banksman. Now this banksman have got to search you before you go down the pit. But of course the detectives were carrying guns and there became an argument now. <laughs> what were we going to do because the banksman was refusing to take us down. The detectives were refusing to give up their uh, firearms or whatever it was they had with them. But in the end, it was okay. Yeah, the detectives had to leave their guns at the top of revolvers, I think they were. And of course, they had threatened now the banksman that these had to be locked in a safe. So he put that right. And also, uh, Phil Weeks, who I knew very well, who was the director of uh, British Coal. He said, look, Elwin, I'm going to send a cameraman down with you. And he said, 
take some photographs, he said, because it would give Merlin something to think about. And he said, not only that, you can put it in the archive somewhere. But it worked out great, and it was a tremendous sort of experience. And that's why Merlin and I became very good friends. The sad thing that I remember him writing to me about is that when he was in Ireland, his secretary got shot, who was always in the car with him. I don't know who actually did the shooting, but... And these people, what I find about these people is that the bigger positions they've got in life, the more humble they become. And, and it's great, you know, because I think the greatness of any person, man or woman, is how humble they can be and how much they should realise then what um, they know better than anybody else. The only thing is that you've had an advantage of a good education. Well, Elwin, 85, what do you think? You've been still doing these sort of jobs. But it's a case of being in a position where you can help. To give you an example of how we've been able to help some youngsters here, one of my friends got a racing stable, and it's in a little village up in Pentoyne. In the racing stable, he's got about 22 race horses, and then he got horses there that are the fetlocks have gone or something have happened and he's repairing them and he's racing on a regular basis. So um, two of the boys here uh, suggested that they wanted to become jockeys. So Mike said to me, do you know anybody in the in the racing world, Elwin? He said, yes, Mike. So uh, the two boys were taken up there. They've done a lot with work experience and one of the boys is now going to register himself in a college up at Doncaster to become a jockey. Now, I don't know about the other boy, but I know this one has actually done that. And it's great, you know, when you can help people in a very small way, because um, they, they, not only don't they ever forget you, but you get an internal feeling, at least I contributed something to that. And it's made the life of that individual a lot better then. It's been a great life and it's taken me to a lot of places. I had an invite to go to um, Israel, I think it was in 1983. And I had an invite to meet a Lieutenant Mordecai Agua, who was um, the man who fought the Six Day War. So when I got to see him, then he said, OK, come to the Knesset, come and have a look around what's happening in Israel now. But of course, he, um, he's held in high ex esteem in, in Israel because of the position he's got, because of the way that he actually dealt with the Egyptian battle, the Six Day War, as they call it. So you meet so many people. It's like this came about. A man called George Wright, who was the General Secretary in, in Wales of the TUC, and I happened to be the chairman, um, and had an invite to go to Israel. So I was talking to Mike Foote about this, and what Mike Foote said to me, well, look, he said, oh, when, when you go out there, make sure that you meet Mordecai Agua. But he was a grand fellow, you know. He was... He was so humble, and not only humble, but he was a, an individual then that was more concerned about us having a tidy society than having wars all the blasted time. He ended up by writing children's books, and then he died eventually, but that again was something that I'd never actually experienced in my life because you'd be walking through the Garden of Gethsemane and you'd find soldiers with, and girls who were soldiers in Jerusalem. And then we went to the sepulchre. And you know, people all seemed to have guns. I put a note, in the Wailing Wall anyway, I put a note, I don't know who picked them up, and I don't know where they go to. But I said, let's have peace in the world. An easy statement to make, but uh, well, a difficult ambition to actually materialise. 
best job that I ever had was being a full-time officer for the trade union movement. What it did, it brought you into situations, say in the steelworks or even in the commercial world, where you realised, and it came home quite strong to me, that those companies and those businesses are there to make sure that they got a financial situation that's acceptable. The good thing you, you, we had was that we could make sure then, as a full-time officer, that some of that percolated off onto the people who were actually making the products. Because um, I used to go to Hoover's, and I know they had a bit of a problem in Hoover's at one time, so the chap might still in touch with him who was the boss there, him and I sat down and we were trying to resolve a problem where the girls on the lines were getting getting bored then and wasn't too insufficient. But if you've been in Hoover's, what happens is that belts pass you and you put the nut on there, put the nut on there, put the nut on there, screw this on there. It was tedious, the job that they were doing. So we come to an arrangement where we changed some of the girls around and we had circular type of systems so that you'd be putting the nut on but you'd also be putting the the other parts that went with the washing machines and the um, cleaners you know that they were making. It was a good company and uh, they were all always hoping then to listen to what you felt was wrong that was disrupting the the production lines and it wasn't a case of money then I think it was just a case of boredom but that worked out all right of course Hoover's is now closed there's a little river that runs down the uh, center of the village where I live in you know, where I lived in Derry so a certain man in the village said, well, look, boys, he said, I'll help you out. We'll dam the river. So we dam the river, and of course then, all of us straight in the water. But you came out of the water dirtier than when you went in. Because what we didn't realise, that the water was coming from the washery, where all the coal is washed. So, you know, the first time I went home, my mother thought I, I must have been long, I'd been down the pit or something. But that was stopped immediately, so the whole thing was knocked down. The Board of Governors, one of the difficulties is that a lot of the meetings are held not in the evening, but during the day. Of course, the good thing with our governors is that they delegate a lot of responsibility to the Finance Committee, to the Curriculum Committee, and to the Personnel Committee and various other committees. The chairman of our Finance Committee is a bank manager and advisor to one of the banks. The person who looks after our Curriculum Committee knows what curriculums are all about. The way that it works is that at our Governor's meeting, we allow everybody to have the say. Uh, we take the items on the agenda and allow everybody to have the say because we've got five governors who are from the Parents' Association. Once that's done, well, we then democratically take a vote on which of the policies we want to follow. If the majority wants to go down this road and not that one, then in fairness to them, all of them put their back behind that particular policy. It's surprising how new governors who come in sort of grow into the job. The one thing that I always find good is for some day some governors to go in and have a look at the school meals, sit down with the students and see what they're eating and how they behave themselves. Mind you, one of the ladies who I went in with one day, she frightened me <laughs> to death almost because one of the boys threw an empty carton onto the floor and she said, pick that up. 
Uh, quite honestly, he came to attention and he picked it up. I could never have done that. I would have tried to persuade him rather than give him a command. But that's the sort of people that we've got, you know. We're very fortunate. I think the boys appreciate too, because we've got a school council, as you know. I, I've been to one or two of the school councils. But we allow the boys then to say what they think is wrong. Yes, I got an MBE and it, for, it was for work that I did in Mid Glamorgan. And I'm not sure how it came about, but I suppose someone somewhere thought, well, we put his name forward and it was successful. In general, it was, I suppose, representing people at things like tribunals who couldn't represent themselves. And lo and behold, um, when I met the Queen, she knew a lot about me. So somebody had briefed her. She did mention quite a bit about the work in, in the university hospital uh, as the vice chairman. But there was certain briefing notes that she was reading from. And I definitely remember UHW because when I came back, there was a lot of the people down there said, well, how did you get that, Ellen? I said, I don't know. But I said, what happened then? I was sent a list of the things that I'd been doing and I didn't realize how much I'd been doing myself. And what happened, and this was by complete coincidence, but it came about, well, reasons I don't know. That was my wife, but on her um, statement as well that comes from the palace. Oh, well, Carol, she worked for Age Concern, and then she worked for a number of organizations like Hospital Discharge, and then, of course, she was asked if she'd work in mental health. And, of course, I always, I call it pulling a leg by saying, well, you know, I had the Queen, you had Prince Charles, <laughs> which <laughs> causes some friction in the house. <laughs> But I love talking to some of the youngsters that are coming up and they say to me, oh, Elwin, where did you get that from? But it's because I've got a good memory. But there's some youngsters, you know, at this moment in time, the headmaster said to me the other day, he said, Elwin, the one thing that we're proud of is that some of our youngsters have passed us as far as education is concerned. And he said, that's what pleases me the most. But it's great working with the school because um, not only do you enjoy it, but there's a fulfillment about it. And I can't get that out of my system. If I see somebody that needs representation, say, who can't basically represent themselves, you can't help that. It's, it's something that drives you on, you know. And um, I don't think I'll ever lose that. I can't lose that sort of feeling of wanting to give people help. It's, and I, uh, when I look at my life and when I look at certain things, I know that if I see somebody that needs help, y you might say that I'm a bit of a Joe Soap or something. But having said that, I enjoy doing it, and especially if the if the result is in the best interest of the person that have got the problem, then it's, it's a tremendous feeling. You go home and you're quite contented. Don't want to know that. If somebody wants help, I want to be there to help them, you know. And When I was 12 years of age, I was offered a job to become a lather boy. And a lather boy meant that there'd be a row of people in the barber shop and um, you used to put the lather on them and then you had to rub their beards and whiskers to soften the stubbles before the barber came around. Well, there was one chap who used to come there. Tom Morgan, his name was. He used to come there and usually used to be usually under the influence. 
And he kept on and kept on that I wasn't rubbing his face harder, harder, harder. So um, he opened his mouth once and he said, harder, and I pushed the brush down his throat with some soap on it. Okay, the immediate effect was that, that I had the sack. Oh, there the rain on the spot, dismissed, <laughs> out. I, I felt sorry about this because it meant about 50 pence a week to me at that particular time. In the little village of Derry, the, there was a lot of pigeon fanciers. So all the pigeon fanciers would put their pigeons in a big lorry that they take them away on a, on a Friday and then they'd release them on the Saturdays for them to race back home. Now some of us boys found out that what was happening was that the pigeon fanciers would be in the pigeon cot and they used to t shake corn in a tin to attract the pigeons back in so they could take the, the ring off his uh, claw and put it into the time machine. Now what us boys thought, well, oh, here's a way now to upset this lot. So we got some stuff and put it in the tin and we used to hide away and shake the tin. And of course the birds now got completely confused. They become schizophrenic because they didn't know which tin they had to follow. <laughs> oh, we had trouble. And I can tell you one thing, the caning we had off the master in the school, i never forget it. And of course the police were called in and the pigeon fancier said we had cost them losing a price, say, of five pound and ten pound because they are pigeons hadn't gone into the, the cots properly. Oh, I never did that again, and neither did the other boys. <laughs>